Hi, everyone. My name is Mari Cohen, and I'm associate editor at Jewish Currents. We're here tonight to talk about American Jewish left organizing and solidarity with Palestine. In the week since October 7th, when Hamas attacked the south of Israel, killing 1,400 Israelis, and Israel began bombing Gaza, American Jewish institutions that had previously expressed alienation from Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's right-wing government have mostly united about around a pro-war position. At the same time, however, record numbers of progressive American Jews have joined the anti-occupation organizations Jewish Voice for Peace, or JVP, and If Not Now, in taking to the streets to call for a ceasefire. In the last three, three weeks, four weeks maybe, Jewish protesters have blocked entrances to the White House, occupied a Capitol Hill building rotunda, and shut down New York City's Grand Central Station to protest U.S. support for bombings that have so far killed more than 10,000 people in Gaza, including more than 4,000 children. Just the hundreds of activists led by JVP occupied the Statue of Liberty, dropping banners that read ceasefire now and Jews for Palestinian freedom. Hi, everybody. Welcome back. We are really sorry about the technical difficulties. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with us. We appreciate your patience. Uh, we think we're back now and that you can hear me. So hoping that is the case, uh, we're going to continue. And um, we've got some great panelists here. So we really appreciate you uh, being here for this discussion. Uh, so I think before we lost sound, um, I had introduced Eva, who is the national spokesperson for If Not Now. Um, and I want to also make sure to introduce our other co-panelists. Um, so we also have here with us Beth Miller, the political director of Jewish Voice for Peace and JVP Action. Um, and we also have Atalia Omer, who is a professor of religion, conflict and peace studies at the University of Notre Dame um, and author of the books, among others, when Peace is Not Enough, How the Israeli Peace Camp Thinks About Religion, Nationalism, and Justice, and Days of Awe, Reimagining Jewishness and Solidarity with Palestinians. Um, so thank you all for being here. And yeah, to get started, um, I wanna ask about the unprecedented nature of this moment. Um, with the largest Jewish demonstrations for Palestine that we've ever seen in the US, I know I've observed some big moments on the Jewish left in the past decade or so, but I've never seen anything quite like this in terms of the numbers that are turning out. So how do the actions of the past few weeks compare to previous moments of Jewish left organizing and solidarity with Palestine? What's different now about the people showing up and the type of actions JVP and If Not Now are doing? Um, and so maybe we can go to Beth first on that. Thanks, Mari. Um, thanks, everyone, for I'm really excited to get to be on this panel and talk about this with all of you. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, like you said, the scale, the, the, the unprecedented nature of what we've been seeing right now really cannot be overstated. Um, a lot of us have been in this work for many, many, many years in the struggle for Palestinian freedom and liberation for many, many years. And, um, you know, in moments of of escalated violence, right? Because we know that every single day, Palestinians are living under the violence of Israeli apartheid. But in these moments where it breaks through into the media, we've seen the ways that um, people in the US turn out and organize, and that's always included Jews as well. Um, but right now, what feels so different is the scale of what's happening, the scale of the Jewish organizing that's happening, and the ways in which it is pretty much non-stop. It is happening constantly, like multiple times a week, we are seeing big um, big protests and uh, that's, that's including a lot of Jewish led organizing and actions. And so I think that the reason it's happening first and foremost is it's matching the scale of the atrocities of what we're seeing, right? I think we are all very clear on the fact that while we have lived through horrific um, and witnessed horrific Israeli military assaults on Palestinians in Gaza, unfortunately, many, many, many times. This is the Israeli government openly, blatantly, unapologetically leading a genocide. It's very clear. They are just not even hiding it anymore. And it's constant. And the numbers of Palestinian children, of Palestinian families that are being wiped out, that are being destroyed, demands that American Jews respond in ways that we never have before. So we're seeing a scale of action, right? These 
thousands of people in front of the White House, led by If Not Now, shutting down the entrances to the White House, thousands of people showing up in front of Congress and hundreds shutting down the Cannon House Rotunda, led by JDP, Grand Central Station being shut down, the Statue of Liberty having a sit-in this morning. These things are constant, and that doesn't even cover then the the popping off Jewish actions that are happening around the country, sit-ins at offices almost every day, federal buildings being shut down, uh, rabbis interrupting President Biden at a fundraiser in Minnesota. Um, American Jews are part of this moment where we are showing that our elected officials do not have a moment of rest or a moment of peace until they finally shift away from a posture of warmongering toward a posture of ceasefire and peace. And the other thing that I want to add is that um, this is also a moment where I think the Jewish progressive movement is part of a broader anti-war struggle, a, the rebirth of an anti-war movement in this country that's being led by Palestinians and by progressive Jews and that's centering Palestinians and Palestine. And we haven't seen that before. And it's also part of the scale of the organizing of this moment, right? What's happening is this urgent call for a ceasefire, for an anti-war posture. And I think that that's fueling the the massive and consistent nature of these things. And I think the other piece of it, of course, that's different right now because of the attacks of October 7th is that Jews in the US, I think are feeling very, very acutely the ways in which genuinely, honestly, not as a talking point, not as a throwaway message, our lives are intertwined and Israeli apartheid makes us all less safe. And everyone is feeling that deeply and acutely. And I think that we're seeing that play out in the way these protests are happening. Okay, thank you, Beth. Really appreciate that. Um, Eva, do you wanna jump in from your perspective? Um, yeah, I mean, co-sign everything that Beth said, I think like particularly first and foremost, the scale of the atrocity um, that's happening to Palestinians. Um, and something that I've thought, and there are a couple of other differences that I want to talk about. Um, um, I mean, the first is, again, as Beth said, and the thing about like is um, Israeli and Palestinian safety being intertwined um, and Jewish and Palestinian safety being intertwined is on like starker and more grotesque and horrific and real display than ever. Um, and, um, and, and the scale of the grief for Israelis is is new is not like anything that I've experienced. Um, I think, um, you know, I was talking with a friend about um, how, given the constant violence, in, in, including especially like the assaults on Gaza that have been ha happening every couple of years, um, um, like there's a phenomenon where we know, like as soon as we see even a couple of Israelis um, who are killed, like we don't even have space to emotionally respond to that grief because we know that the Israeli government is going to then kill at least 10 times, if not more, Palestinians. Um, and um, in this case, though, like the scale of um, the massacre that happened to Israelis on October 7th, um, my experience of it was that it like touched the American Jewish community and my American Jewish communities and the, and the American Jewish left um, at a depth and scale that we have not experienced. And so like people on, if not now staff are grieving, like I'm personally two degrees of separation removed from like two of the 200 hostages in Gaza. Um, like this is really close to home, including for progressive Jews across the board um, in a way that um, obviously, like um, Israelis who are mobilizing against this are experiencing, and also that Palestinians have been experiencing for decades in terms of mobilizing through um, and organizing against this horrific violence of apartheid um, through very personal grief that like touches their diaspora community um, uh, in ways like I was texting Palestinian colleagues and being like, I literally know, you know what this is like, like. I had, you know, I have a coworker who had like a friend and her two little kids murdered like on October 7th and like was just texting Palestinian colleagues like I have no words like I know that you know exactly what it feels like to show up to work the next day. Um, and um, 
And so, yeah, coming from a really like authentic place of grief and um, holding the the ways in which our liberation is bound together in in ways that are not theoretical, they're not about messaging, they're not rhetorical, they're very, very real, and confronting the challenge of organizing our community of American Jews who are dealing with real grief at that scale for the first time and are reacting out of um, a, a trauma that is at the like a trauma response that is at the most intense it's ever been and that is is um feels unprecedented um uh in term in, in terms of like what many of us have experienced in our lifetimes um and um and we're you know we're, we're doing it anyway and like really the only place that people can be is in the streets um and um together in community holding the grief and holding the action at the scale the moment demands um and like i just you know the jvp grand central action like was the only place i could have possibly been that friday um and um yeah it's we, we have no choice yeah, great. Thank you, Eva. Um, Atalia, I'll go to you now and, you know, kind of ask what you're making of this moment, um, especially compared to, you know, research that you've done um, on the Jews Jewish left organizing in the past for your book. Yeah, I mean, first of all, I want to echo um, uh, both reflections um, uh, that were articulated now and really um, uh, underscore the point about the um, uh, the urgency, I mean, the sense of urgency holding on to um, and recognizing and experiencing very deeply for many American Jews um, and Jews beyond the United States, of course, um, of the um, um, uh, the violence that happened, the grief, the death, the loss, but also the deep recognition of um, how it's being deployed and the weaponization of it. And to even get to that kind analysis that immediately sent people to the streets uh, in the way that um, I was just described of, I, you know, I couldn't go, I, I mean, I couldn't be anywhere else but in Grand Central Station um, to uh, stop business as usual. Uh, this does not happen instinctively and out of, you know, just um, uh, because of the outrage, the ethical outrage um, that uh, is generated by what we know is happening, I mean, the, the ethnic cleansing and genocidal uh, practices that are happening in Gaza and the West Bank and Occupy East Jerusalem um, uh, as we speak. Um, so uh, 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 the point is that really to recognize kind of the depths of the history of organizing that um, if not now and Jewish Voice for Peace and um, and, and other um, uh, Jewish organizing um, has done over the years in terms of uh, facilitating for so many uh, people uh, kind of deep processes of unlearning, often the process that is very painful, of unlearning kind of the um, um, uh, Zionism. And uh, so, uh, so this is just to highlight the fact that um, a whole lot, I mean, yes, we have the moment, but uh, the kind of massive mobilization that happened is not only because of the, mass, the, the, the scale of the atrocities, uh, but also the kind of deep work that has been going on for, for so many years. And I think that uh, j just another uh, kind of point that I want to highlight about the, the moment um, uh, with respect to American Jewish organizing uh, in solidarity with Palestinians, but al also uh, I would say by kind of connecting to the grief of the loss of so many of us, of also our Jewish Israeli friends, um, uh, there is um, uh, also uh, kind of um, uh, a sense of recognition that, like what you said, the lives are intertwined, the liberation are intertwined, and that um, uh, there is recognition of a need to kind of also uplift the very, you know, the, the really courageous voices in Israel, uh, in Israel uh, in the Israeli context and, and, and Palestine, who are trying to, to, to get together and show up uh, in solidarity with one another in the, in the context itself. Uh, another point that I want to highlight is that um, American Jews show up and, uh, and, and relentlessly um, since, that, since the atrocities uh, kind of escalated um, is because of that intersection of being also American. Um, and, um, and and being there as American um, American Jews and and calling out the um, uh, the, the imperial Amer American imperialism uh, and militarism that it happens what what is happening is happening in our name as Jews and as Americans 
uh, and that really kind of that level is also really escalated um, and I think manifests on the, in the streets and the actions. Um, thank you so much. Yes. Um, Beth, feel free to jump in if you want to add something there. Thanks. Yeah, Atalia, I appreciate you naming that. I think that's such a critical point, right? Is that the reason specifically that as American Jews we are doing this is it's it's, a, it's hugely because of the American part. And I think that's such a critical point to name. And I think another feeder into why there has been such scale here of these protests is the um, like, I think we should specifically name the ways in which the Biden administration has so deeply failed in this moment. Like we talked about like the need to posture away from war, but I think it's worth saying that it's like, as Americans across the board, Jewish or not, we are sending $3.8 billion. That's about to be, there's about to be another $14.3 billion on top of that. Like, let that that is an overwhelming, disgusting amount of military funding to go to this government. Um, and are, you know, in again, not you know, we know that in every moment that there is an assault on Gaza by the Israeli military, there's like a pattern to the way the US responds. It's always standing with Israel. It's always Israel has a right to defend itself, even though what it's doing is not actually an in international law self-defense. And it normally moves toward the posture of like ceasefire faster than it has here. The center has fallen out completely in the US over the last several weeks. People have like just like fallen rightward and kind of completely lost their moral bearing. And the Biden administration has been a huge part of that and of dragging people in the wrong direction and of openly advocating for supporting and being complicit in what's happening right now and in this, this ethnic cleansing and this genocide and these mass atrocities. And I think that seeing that, seeing how the center has fallen out, the ways that this is, that the Biden administration is so far off course has also been a huge push factor for American Jewish communities to feel a need to be 50 times louder in this moment. Yeah, Eva, did you wanna add something there as well? Yeah, sorry, just off of that, this has been at the center of a lot of the things that have, a lot of the organizing that we've been doing um, and a, a lot of the energy in the first week after this, like I was, I'm trying to think like maybe six when the Iraq war um, happened um, and um, uh, and and we obviously we all know how like disastrous that was um, from the U.S. perspective and the scale of the horrific like death that the U.S. was responsible for. Um, and the first week, a couple of weeks after this happened, like I was literally just calling five friends a day, and everyone else was doing the same, saying like, "Y'all, this is our Iraq War. Like this is our chance. Like our generation. Like this. Like to basically redo. Like what would we have done had we had we not been like five or six years old? Um, and and, and also, like, we are in a country that saw all of that happen um, and so has a context not only about um, the U.S. posture on Israel-Palestine, but also, um, like, has lived through the Iraq war um, and so has that historical memory about, like, what this American response is and where it's coming from. And then you have Biden, um, you know, clips circulating from Joe Biden about, like, if there weren't an Israel, we would need to create one to protect U.S. interests in the region. Y'all, I feel like I have been screaming about that quote for years. The first time that I saw him say that was at a J Street conference in 2017. And I was a sophomore in college. And I was like, oh, this isn't about us at all. Like, <laughs> this is about Israel as like a satellite state <laughs> for the United States of America to like like enact like a larger agenda in the Middle East. Um, and and we're seeing that message like circulated on social media and in circles and at rallies, et cetera, at a, in a way that I have I, I have not seen or experienced. Um, and um, and that I think is is deeply powerful and feels very very different. Great, thank you so much. Um, so my next question touches on something that all three of you brought up in your answers, which is kind of the role in Jewish grief over the attacks on Israeli citizens um, in on October 7th by Hamas. Um, and this is a, something that the left has 
faced um, some internal division over, you know, about those responses to October 7th and the extent to which activists should foreground grief over Israeli civilians killed, you know, a tension that sometimes results in a different mess in messaging between Jewish led protests and Palestinian led ones. Um, to describe this, I'll just quote a few lines from what um, editor in chief of Jewish Currents, Ariel Angel, wrote in Jewish Currents in her letter from the editor on October 12th. She said, already complex and fragile relationships between Palestinian and left-wing Jewish activists, as well as factions within both of these groups, are being challenged as we struggle to derive the same meaning from the images coming across our screens. Friends and colleagues on all sides find themselves hurt by one another's public reactions or by their silence. A veteran anti-Zionist activist I spoke to wondered if a chasm was opening up between Palestinian and Jewish activists. Over the weekend, many avowed anti-Zionist Jews found that they could not join solidarity protests because they needed something the protest could not provide, a space to grieve the Israeli dead, to struggle with their own place in the coming political process. Um, and obviously those words were written uh, nearly a month ago, but I think have framed some of the tensions that especially um, you know, racked the movement in those first few weeks. And so I'm interested in, you know, our JVP and if not now facing conflict either internally or with partners over how to navigate these issues. And, you know, I'm wondering about how it's um, affecting your relationship with Palestinian partners and Palestinian led actions, um, you know, including like the mass Palestine protest in DC on November 4th, uh, which many anti-Zionist Jewish activists attended, um, you know, and openly attended as Jews in terms of their signs, but, you know, um, JVP and If Not Now and other Jewish organizations didn't officially co-sponsor it. Uh, so I'm just wondering if some of you, if you guys could speak to those tensions. Um, Eva, maybe we'll start with you there. Okay, I'll, um, I'll let Beth talk about some of the movement dynamics in this because you have a much like, longer history of organizing in these relationships than I do. But um, um, what I will say is that like, um, I do think that it's important, at least from my personal experience, like I think that it is telling that that piece was written so soon after the October 7th attack. Um, because like what I've experienced, like something that someone said again in, in sort of early, if not now conversations about this, about like our response was just like, like in, in these days and weeks, like it's gonna be so more important, like what we do is gonna be so much more important than what we say. Um, and I think there has been something really powerful um, that I've just personally experienced in terms of building relationship and trust with Palestinian partners of like Jews en masse being like, no, we're for real, for real. We're going to stop this fucking genocide and we're going to do it through our grief. And we're unapologetic about the grief. And we're also unapologetic about the fact that we are like hundreds of us are getting arrested in the Capitol building right now um, because like we are so clear that this is life or death and our safety is bound together. Um, I think about that that quote of like, um, you know, if you're here to help me, you're wasting your time. But if you're here because your liberation is bound up with mine, then like, let's work together. Um, and just people are feeling that for real. And they're also, you know, they're they're letting it drive them to action and, and you know, whatever, at different degrees, obviously, but like risk and sacrifice and like doing things in public, not as a performance, literally because like we are like, we feel so deeply that we need to stop this genocide and that we refuse for it to happen in our names and how dare our politicians claim that it's about us. Um, and I think that like, within my personal relationships, like that is creating more trust and partnership and actually shared understanding of like what our liberation is going to look like. Um, like, obviously, like there, you know, there's going to be tension, there's going to be disagreements, and people are going to say different things, whatever. But like, we are so, so clear that like we're in this together for all of it to get a ceasefire and then um, to bring about like an end to the apartheid occupation and siege that like got us into this in the first place. Yeah, thank you, Eva. Um, Beth, do you want to jump in? And yeah, I'm definitely curious if you want to talk a little bit about those movement dynamics as well. Yeah, I mean, I think I think Eva, it's a great point that you raised about like you know when Ariel's beautiful piece was written, and and you know, Mari, you mentioned before this has been um, this will now have been a month of these brutal assaults, these brutal attacks, a month since these horrific attacks happened um, against Israelis, like we're, this is becoming a really prolonged, horrific daily nightmare. And um, I think that there's a lot of focus on where there has been disagreement, which is understandable. But I think truly, truly, there's 
also overwhelming unity right now that's happening. And I, that's actually what I want to speak to right now in terms of the dynamics. And there, like Eva said, there will always be, there are always going to be strategic differences. There are always going to be disagreements in any social justice movement and any movement for liberation. And certainly between people who are allies, following the lead, the accountability of people who are impacted in different ways. And the unity behind the demand for ceasefire first and foremost now in all of these protests that have been happening, maybe maybe that first weekend, I think it was different because like we, we didn't know the situation, things were changing so rapidly. Since then, the, the movement has really truly been like, there is one core desperately, direly, urgently needed thing. And that's in Palestinian led rallies, that's in Jewish led rallies, that's in rallies led by black and brown communities and clergy and um, other affinity groups, you know, across the board. Um, it's ceasefire. And that is actually something that um, I think is really powerful and really, really special. Like, like Eva, like you said, there's a people reckoning with the fact that like, there were horrific attacks that happened on October 7th, and the clock didn't stop on October 7th. It didn't start on October 7th, and it didn't stop on October 7th. And now we all need, we all are oriented toward like, the horrors that the Israeli military is um, perpetuating against Palestinians in Gaza. And like, there is a lot of unity around that top line demand. Um, and I think that that's, that's like a really incredibly powerful thing. And I know we're obviously focused on Jewish communities here, but I do think it's worth noting as well that like, that unity within the movement, that unity within like the folks who are impacted in different ways calling for a ceasefire has also played out in so many other really critical arenas, right? Like we're seeing dissent cables from within the State Department calling for a ceasefire, congressional staffers who are joining the march on November 4th calling for a ceasefire, Biden staff having a uh, dissent, um, US aid workers, DNC staffers, former Warren staff, Warren Bernie staff. Um, and that's because again, there is also this kind of unprecedented, sorry, not unprecedented, rather, a rebirth of an anti-war movement right now behind this moment. And so I actually think that that's truly the the kind of um, hopeful thing that's like happening right now and dynamic that's present. Great, thank you so much. Um, Atali, I'm interested in your perspective on these dynamics. Yeah, I mean, I think it's very important, again, to bring kind of the um, uh, a little bit of a historical perspective in terms of moments like that uh, in the movement and how they were navigated. Of course, again, the level of uh, the, the urgencies, um, like something that we we uh, we I mean it's unprecedented in the in the sense that it's so uh, the brutality is so so explicit. Um, but, um, but but there were moments of. Um, um, of that, that could have been moments of divergence, and uh, and there was concentrated effort to do uh, cross learning and unlearning within kind of the broader movement that uh, that you can you can group it within kind of uh, anti militarism, but it's beyond that. It's also about racial justice and kind of broader uh, social justice uh, uh, struggle. So I'm thinking of uh, the kind of the kind of tension that emerged to the foreground around the time when. Um, Tamika Mallory um, attended the um, uh, Louis Farrakhan speech, I mean, she, and, and kind of also um, augmented it uh, through her social media platforms uh, that was transphobic, homophobic, uh, misogyny, and also um, anti-Semitic. Um, and at the, at the moment, uh, uh, at that moment, that was in 2018, I believe, um, uh, at the, and of course, the, the women's marches are a long history of the, those kind of tensions in that broader left uh, manifesting around questions around Palestine uh, and Palestinian freedom. Uh, but at that moment, there was a concentrated effort by uh, Jews for uh, racial and economic justice to uh, to engage very deeply uh, in that cross learning within the movement, not to cancel, but engage and bring together uh, through, you know, well, understanding what is anti-Semitism and what is not anti-Semitism, um, and 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 so forth. So, so this is just to highlight the, the importance of the the history, the relationship. I know that f uh, for me, I sought uh, sought out my Palestinian friends and to be together in in those spaces, um, uh, centering. Um, 
uh, centering human, uh, human life and our commitment to, um, uh, to freedom and dignity and also recognition of everyone's humanity and making distinctions between, um, uh, between the, the regime um, that is uh, violent and supremacist and, um, and the people. This is very important also if you reflect back at like the, the struggle, uh, the anti-apartheid struggle in South Africa. Um, and, and, and so being able to make those distinctions and also bringing those distinctions to the social movement spaces is very critical. It's not something that can be just told, it's kind of learned through relationships. And, uh, and, th and those relationships are deep, and so they are not. So, so I don't think that there. I, th I think that uh, just to echo the points that things that the relation that the movement is only becoming stronger. Thank you. Yeah, I, I do think um, these moments of unity have also been been very powerful to witness. Um, one other thing I think would be good for us to talk about is the way in which, despite this surge in American Jewish political action, uh, so far most American Jewish politicians, uh, both in Congress and the Senate, have not matched their energy. Uh, none yet have called for a ceasefire, uh, which includes Bernie Sanders, uh, which, you know, the fact that he so far has not made that call um, has been a real disappointment to uh, many progressive American Jews and other Americans on the left uh, who, you know, may have previously looked up to him. So, you know, what kind of accounts for this divergence in terms of this movement and American Jewish political representation? And, you know, what can we do about it? Uh, so, Beth, maybe I'll go to you first on that. Yeah, what is going on? <laughs> That's my question as well. Where are all of our Jewish politicians right now? It's a it's the it's a great question, um, and it it makes me feel like I'm kind of um, you know it, it it's it's easy to kind of feel like you're losing your mind a bit, right? Where are they? What we're seeing from some of the Jewish politicians that we would expect to have already long been calling for a ceasefire, Bernie Sanders is included. Um, Jamie Raskin should have been calling for a ceasefire. We'd love to hear Sarah Jacobs call for a ceasefire. There's a lot of folks who are in Congress, who are in positions of power, who have uh, generally very like, you know, better foreign policy positions and um, a better understanding of things. Bernie ran on an anti-war platform. And, you know, I think that, um, what we're seeing is that there's a there's a passionate plea for humanity that is happening from a lot of these folks, but then it gets like we've seen like Bernie give incredibly some of the most passionate speeches on the House floor about like humanitarian aid, about the humanity of Palestinians, about the need for freedom and dignity and life of Palestinians. But then the demand, the ask stops at like humanitarian pause. It makes no sense. It makes no sense, right? To, to to have folks who are saying the situation is so dire, and this is this is not just him. I'm speaking more broadly now about Jewish politicians who who um, should be further than where they are. To see them speak so passionately in some cases about what's happening, and other cases less passionately, but to know they have an understanding of what's going on, but to then call for a pause. That is truly unacceptable. We need our Jewish politicians to be matching where their rapidly growing Jewish base, including young, but also intergenerational Jews and progressive Jews across the country are, which is demanding a ceasefire right now. And I think that, you know, I think that there's different reasons for different folks on why they haven't gotten there yet, right? Like there's a huge range of, of reasons for every different politician. I think that for a lot of them, they're hearing from a lot of Jewish communities that are, um, really only focused on what happened on October 7th and have not caught up yet to the reality of the fact that the Israeli military has now killed over 10,000 Palestinians, including over 4,000 children in Gaza since then. And um, I mean, I, I think that there, there's also Jewish politicians, of course, who are, you know, there's those who should be further than they are, like Bernie. And then there are those Jewish politicians who are, in fact, leading the, the war call on the other side, right? You've got like Josh Gottheimer and folks on the other side who are full on attempting to completely dehumanize Palestinians and beat these drums of war and take full advantage of this moment. 
Um, I think it's a real failure of our of our leadership right now. And um, of course, it's also matched, backed, and encouraged by American Jewish legacy institutions, which have a lot of relationships and have been doing, you know, advocacy, lobbying work for a long time um, to push against a call for a ceasefire right now as well. And um, they fit in, all of that fits into the broader, like, war machine that is at play, right? Like, American Jewish legacy institutions have one role that they play. And then there is, like, Boeing, Raytheon, Lockheed Martin, all the all the reasons that like our government is postured in this way. And like Eva said, all of this is really about us having a state in the Middle East that we can consider an ally. Um, but ultimately, I think that like this moment really is exposing where our our Jewish politicians are falling short and lacking. And I think it's a matter of time before they move because of the pressure being put upon them. But it truly is. Um, uh, disappointing, perhaps not shocking, but very, very, very upsetting. Um, you know, Atalia, maybe I'll go to you next. I'm curious what you make of that split between, you know, the politicians and, you know, the masses of the Jewish left. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, in the same way that we talked about how um, kind of the depth of the relationship building and the infrastructure uh, within kind of the social movement and the organizing uh, in the Jewish left that immediately was kind of you know, um, 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 really uh, rose to the to the moment, including um, um, the rabbis. I mean, the rabbis for ceasefire and that particular, like uh, drawing explicitly on uh, the Jewish tradition, uh, not only Jewish bodies, uh, but also the tradition to uh, to challenge um, uh, to challenge both the Jewish community, the establishment, and so forth, but also the the ways in which. Um, yeah, Jewish grief and 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 the legacy of uh, uh, of, of the Holocaust is being weaponized in speeches by Biden and Blinken and and um, and of course uh, uh, Netanyahu's government. Um, so, but, but in the same way that uh, that the infrastructure of of social movement um, uh, was really kind of mobilized um, uh, for people to put bodies on the on on. Um, on the line, um, we have an infrastructure that is so uh, effective uh, with respect to um, uh, to silencing debate, uh, to censoring people, uh, to uh, and most critically uh, to equate to conflate um, Israel with 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 Jews, um, and so um, that is so uh, deep. Uh, in people's consciousness, especially in the United States. I mean, if you do, you look at the, the globe um, uh, broadly, you see a very different picture. I mean, this is really important to point out the kind of protests that are happening globally. So the quote unquote international community is a very pathetic, narrow, uh, uh, you know, chunk of the world, uh, but extremely, extremely uh, powerful. And the U.S. of course has a critical role in in in, in making that very reaching that very. Um, uh, you know, very small threshold of ceasefire. That's a very, very bare minimum uh, of of where need, uh, we need to go uh, in terms of of healing and justice. Uh, but uh, uh, the point is that the uh, the narrative is so is so deep. The media um, uh, is absolutely to be interrogated, and there is a long history there. Um, and also, there are other kind of actors. So I would want to. Um, uh, to gently kind of push on that point, on the, the earlier point about, um, you know, that it's only about like political realism, like propping up Israel as the ally of the U.S. Because, I mean, there is a lot of literature uh, that shows that, in fact, that love, the unconditional love that the U.S. has uh, had um, toward Israel that also fluctuated over the years, it's not from the beginning of time, uh, is um, actually against American interest. Uh, uh, in the region, so, uh, so so then it brings to the to the foreground question of well, why why then it's still doing it against its presumed self interest, uh, and here one need, needs to bring into the analysis, you know, Christian Zionism and the kind of um, you know the um, uh, the evangelicals and how they you know participate actively in the kind of uh, you know um, uh, the the, um, the silencing of debate, the policies. Um, and, um, and and all kind of issues that influence the uh, the politicians, uh, but the point is that Zionism 
uh, is so um, uh, embedded in the American framework. Um, and, uh, and, 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 and what happened on October 7th, um, and the way it was deployed and, and presented in the media uh, really uh, was triggering. Uh, and in many respects, many people I see regress into an unreconstructed un understanding of, of Israel and the occupation and the apartheid regime and all the other kind of work that have we, we, as a movement we were we were able to accomplish for so for so long in terms of shifting some of the uh, the debates. Um, great, yeah, I think that's really interesting. Um, and Eva, I'm going to bring you in on this. Um, and I know we also had a question in, from the chat about, um, you know, how to think about the ways in which some of these politicians might be reacting to rising fears of anti-Semitism at the moment, and whether that's, you know, influencing their positions. Um, so maybe you could address that as well. We could talk about that. But yeah, go ahead. Sure. I mean, I feel like Beth talked about a lot of the factors uh, that are like informing our politicians choices apparently right now. Um, I literally like was standing out outside of, you know, Senator Sanders office this past week and I was just like, I feel like we are living in a parallel universe. Like, are we all looking at the same reality? Um, and, um, and, and like, again, also, as Beth said earlier, like every time this has happened, we know that the end is ceasefire. Like you cannot end a war, you cannot end a genocide by continuing to drop bombs. Like actually the end is a ceasefire. And the question is for which politicians are like 4,000 innocent Palestinians killed enough to call for ceasefire and say enough? Um, and for which po which politicians needed 10,000? Which politicians, 10,000 is not enough. And we thought that some of these politicians we're not 10,000 kind of people. Um, oh, well, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I mean, I just want to I, to reinforce this point that really speaks to the issue of the, the dehumanization of Palestinians, that it, for Bernie Sanders, it's OK to talk about uh, you know, um, the Palestinian Gaza in terms of human, through a humanitarian uh, prism. Uh, but humanitarianism is very different than human rights. Uh, and the political aspiration, uh, which are at the root of, um, of of what is at stake. So it's not the ceasefire, it's the freedom. So anyway, sorry, I was jumping. No, no, it's okay. But this is the thing, okay, is that like, especially for Jewish politicians, um, obviously there are some people who are like completely on the other side um, and are like basically like the faces of the idea that Jewish safety is only secured through domination. Um, but there are a lot of people who we know do not believe that. Um, and this thing that I want to shake them and say, again, in terms of like the material ways in which Jewish and Palestinian safety and Israeli and Palestinian safety are intertwined is like, we know that this could like very easily and quickly turn into a broader regional conflict that puts all Israelis and Palestinians in danger, like while this genocide is happening. Um, and what's gonna happen to our loved ones in Israel? Also, like, is that is a genocide in Gaza? Like, what's the plan? Like, are is, like there's gonna be an insane global rise in anti-Semitism after that because the US is backing this war right now. Absolutely not. For, and even even if you need it to be really close to home, OK, like for the 2024 election, I was a Biden organizer in Arizona in 2020. Do you how many, know how many states you won that by? How many people? It was like 10,000 for the whole state. Like, I know exactly how hard it is to get like young people to vote under normal circumstances. OK, it's hard. Um, like lo the logistics, especially for young people, are really difficult. We're not used to it yet. It's like it's really difficult to get them to vote. And when people were mobilized and energized as they were in the prior election, like we saw this huge youth, youth vote turnout. Um, and now, again, as an organizer who knows exactly how difficult that is, like it is completely irresponsible, again, for everyone, including for Jews, for Biden to throw the 2024 election to Trump and enable this white nationalist anti-Semitic movement in this country. Like, 
oh my god um and so i just want to shake them and be like it's us and them like get a grip um and yeah i just i really have no words but oh my god <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Beth, I have to jump in as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, I share your, <laughs> the madness it induces, but I think, I mean, Atali, I think it's that, it's ultimately that, it's the dehumanization of Palestinians, right? And we've seen, we've seen this grow and live as this horrible thing in society here, in the way media talks about Palestinians, in the way our politicians talk about Palestinians, and it got us to today. It got us to right now when we have members of Congress who will rightfully mourn the Israeli children who were killed on October 7th, but who have no empathy to give for the, for the Palestinian children who are terrified to try to fall asleep at night because there is literally no safe place in Gaza for them to sleep. And who, while they can mourn for Israeli life, are more than willing to then turn around and talk about how well Palestinians in Gaza deserve this, right? Who are basically endorsing like revenge as some sort of foreign policy position. And who, to add on to that, progressive politicians who know better and know that we should be talking about people and we should be talking about root causes where it all goes out the window immediately. They don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about they don't want to talk about 15 years of siege. They don't want to talk about decades of occupation, decades of apartheid. They don't want to talk about how most people living in Gaza have already been made refugees multiple times over. They don't care. They don't have the empathy for it. And that's anti-Palestinian racism and it's Islamophobia. And it ties into the question we got from the chat too about the fear around rising anti-Semitism. There is really scary rising anti-Semitism, and it absolutely is connected to even what you just said, which is the ways in which the Israeli state and Zionism has very intentionally attempted to conflate Jews and the Israeli state when we are not, we should not be conflated. And there's also horrific, deadly rising Islamophobia and anti-Arab racism, racism in this country right now. A six-year-old Palestinian child in Chicago was killed. And it's because of the fact that our politicians, including Joe Biden, are getting up on the public stage and dehumanizing Palestinians and blaming Palestinians for violence. And these things, again, it goes back to the core of this whole panel, which is that our safeties are intertwined. You cannot separate them. And there are, there are power dynamics at play. There is one government that controls the lives of everyone, all Palestinians and Israelis living from Gaza, living from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River. There is one government in control. And we need to talk about those dynamics. We need to talk about the context. We need to talk about the root causes. And we need to stop allowing the dehumanization of Palestinians that happens across all contents in the US, contexts in the US. Yeah, thank you, Beth. Um, you know, so I know that we are getting close to the end of our time here, but there's another thing I did want to ask about, which is kind of going back to the um, you know, what I talked about uh, at the beginning of our panel tonight, which is the way in which, and which some of you have alluded to um, in your answers, is that there has been this kind of divide now between, like, you know, the Jewish left and these progressives who are organizing, and then where the institutional Jewish community is, you know, similar to the politicians that we talked about, but the way that while one side is taking to the street more than ever, you know, the other side is actually snapped back into this, you know, very staunch pro-Israel posture, um, you know, not questioning it, you know, that there's just this real, it's very hard to speak the same language when, um, you know, when this dehumanization is going on, when this inability to look at the context, when this just focus only on the trauma of October 7th, um, you know, without now turning to to oppose the, um, you know, ongoing assault on Gaza and those civilian casualties. So, you know, given that that's what's happening, um, is can we, can the Jewish left, like, face the mainstream Jewish community at the moment? Like, is are we able to persuade them? Like, are they reachable? Or is it better to just, you know, work on organizing other Americans? And, you know, is, have we, can that be a target right now? You know, so that's something that I'm thinking about. And I'd be interested in all your thoughts. Um, maybe I'll start with Eva, because I know you might have to hop off soon. But if there's anything you want to say uh, before, before you go. I mean, I think all of it is necessary. Um, 
again, because this is being done in our names and because like in terms of this anti-war movement that is emerging right now um, or reviving, um, like with Jews and Pal like Jews and Palestinians, like the Palestinians at the center, like resisting this genocide um, and also resisting um, this like horrific apartheid status quo that pits our safety against each other. Um, like the thing that's emerging is like an anti-imperialist vision for U.S. foreign policy that includes Jews and Jewish liberation as an anti-imperial project. Um, and I mean, like thinking about like what would a Green New Deal for foreign policy look like, which is going to be so acutely necessary. There are going to be billions of climate refugees, so many of whom the U.S. is responsible for creating. Um, and like, what is it going to look like to reimagine the U.S.'s role in the world um, and outsourcing your anti-Semitism problem to this like to this country in the Middle East through like the, the Christian Zionism of our country, like is not the answer. And we need to put forth this other like Jewish liberation that is also intertwined with a broader U.S. foreign foreign policy vision and domestic and immigration policy vision um, that's going to like be able to like take us into the rest of this century. Um, we need it existentially. Um, and um, so like Jews have to be a part of that. Um, and everyone has to be a part of it. Um, and so like we can't we can't abandon um, the Jewish community because us taking away um, the idea that this is being done in our names, um, the cover of that is like really, really crucial. Um, and um, and like also like we can't only speak to Jews and we need everyone um, partly because, and I mean, what that means tangibly in terms of thinking about a movement is that we, like, we also have to be reaching for Palestinians and uh, in particular um, and finding the unity that Beth was talking about and leading from that place. Um, because if we only do that and talk to the Jewish community, which is in sort of like a parallel universe that that like millions of dollars of funding of our communal institutions for decades has created, um, uh, like we will we will lose like the the everyone else that we like need to be working with in order to win the America that we need and in order to win the world that we need. Yeah, thank you, Eva. Um, yeah, Beth, let's go to you on this one. Yeah. Um, I think we absolutely cannot stop working to move and change the minds and like bring closer our Jewish communities that are not yet with us on this call for a ceasefire, first and foremost but then on the call to end the blockade, on the call to end the occupation, on the call to end apartheid, on the idea that like Palestinians deserve freedom and liberation. We cannot, we cannot let that go. We cannot cede that space. And I think that, you know, there's a lot of like, there's a lot of legacy American Jewish institutions that take up a lot of space in the public conversation on this issue. And that doesn't necessarily mean that they actually represent the the viewpoint of like individual American Jews across the board. We all know this, right? In the same way that even JVP, we don't, everything I say doesn't represent, you know, where all of our members are at even. But more broadly speaking, like I think that we need to remember that there's a lot of people who are, um, most people in our communities are actually operating from a place of fear, of trauma, and of, um, a learned idea of like Palestinian dehumanization, like they were taught Palestinian dehumanization if they grew up in like Zionist spaces. Um, and they're trying to figure this moment out, a lot of them. And they're being, by a lot of, a lot of times they're being like led to the wrong answer, right? And that's not, that this is true for folks around the world. This is not unique to the Jewish community, right? We know that in moments of crisis like this, in moments of violence like this, people are told that the safety comes from building higher walls and from having bigger guns and from dropping larger bombs. This happens like over and over and over again. And the Jewish community is not special and we are no exception. We it's happening to us too right now. And so I think that, you know, what we've been seeing in JBP is that there's actually a lot of um, power in just naming the things right and not being afraid to say like this is an imminent genocide and we're gonna we're gonna say why we're not gonna just like just name it and then like hope that you get it or you don't 
We're going to say it. And then we're going to like talk about why, why the genocide, why is what's so happening? So terrifying. Why does it matter that we speak out? And what we're seeing is that a lot of people actually, they're like, we should actually trust our people. A lot of them are like moving through their own personal grief, places of discomfort, places of confusion to like, be like, okay, yeah, no, but you know what? Right now I should show up. I should show up in this way. And there's a lot of folks who are just like unaffiliated, right? Like most people aren't a member of, you know, they're not like all part of the ADL or all part of JVP or all part of anything. Like they're just folks. And so they, they will go to the, the moral compass that makes the most sense. And I think it, it's the importance of the, the first question you asked, Mari, which is the scale and the unprecedented nature of what's happening. Is that like the ceasefire demand, if, if we can break through the like, the, the kind of like very empty opposition talking points to it, it's the clear moral humanitarian call that actually probably most people when they really understand what's going on would agree with. And it's our job, the job of this not now, of JVP, of all of us, to not give up on trying to move them toward us because we have to, we have an obligation to. And because for the sake of our own community, we cannot let it be that the Jewish American community sat by and cheered on or at bare minimum let happen a genocide of Palestinians. We cannot let that happen. And we also have to speak to the broader American public. It's like Eva said, it's a both and. And I think there, the role is to like, use the fact that, you know, um, we have a particular moral voice right now, which is to say that we are American Jews who are, this is happening in our name. And we're gonna say to all of you who are not American Jews, here's why this is wrong. Here's why we disagree with it. And so we can do both at the same time. And we, we must do both at the same time. Yes, I mean, I, I agree with um, what you both said, what you both articulated. I think it's very, I just want to underscore the point about, um, I mean, from also my, my research on um, kind of um, uh, with uh, American Jews who uh, mobilized, um, uh, who became critics of Israeli policies and Zionism, and uh, and some of them became explicitly Palestinian solidarity activists. Uh, that there is such a depth of um, uh, crisis in terms of uh, with with respect to um, uh, to the infrastructure of uh, teachers, um, schools, Jewish education, um, and there is also at the same time because of that, because of the fear of the loss of narrative. Um, uh, there is such doubling down, uh, and like, in, like, like um, the kind of um, how we describe the the convergences of various actors, anti uh, anti militarism, feminist, um, you know, all kind of actors in that space, anti anti racism. You all, all those liberations, all those struggles are interconnected and intersectional. We also see convergences of a variety of actors um, that um, that that underwrite. Um, belligerence and militarism and um, and imperialism and kind of neo neo imperial uh, stances uh, in the region and beyond. So um, so it's important to identify those convergences and do the act. I mean, just to, to reinforce the point uh, uh, that both of you made, uh, uh, activism activism should not be segregated. Uh, in fact, to segregate the activism uh, is uh, to become um, kind of to, is to fall into the the framing. Um, that wants to see segregation of of those um, of those uh, struggles, um, and I, I want to add just one one point that I think it really is important to um, to, to to really bring into the space of uh, the activist space and the, and the struggle, uh, the fact that. Uh, to be in solidarity with Palestine and Palestinians also means to be uh, in, uh, to, uh, to you know, to seek justice uh, and, and liberation for Israelis from the regime of Jewish supremacy. Um, that again, to not you know, dehumanize um, uh, Israelis in that um, struggle. Okay, I know Eva. Maybe you wanted to add one more thing to close us out. Um, yeah, I mean, just just 100% to both of those things. And I think like, I don't know, and obviously other people have a longer memory of what this struggle has felt like um, for um, decades longer than I have, but I feel like I've been screaming for at least a decade um, that like, 
basically that there are, we know like what we've been saying, like there are two competing definitions uh, or two competing visions for Jewish safety um, through like walls and militarization and weapons and military dominance and repression um, of the Palestinian people um, and unconditional support for that from the US. Um, or um, like the fact that all our safety is actually tied together and we can't just win safety for ourselves on our own unless there's safety for other people. Um, and like they've called us naive. Um, <laughs> and like October 7th was like, you know, a shattering of the idea um, that the arrogance um, and the idea that you could, you could, um, repress a people for decades under apartheid and siege and brutalize them every single time they try to non-violently resist and not expect disaster to happen to your own citizens obviously everyone has agency um but also like that idea and that illusion of safety is shattered um and in the us like we're seeing this grotesque like apex support for insurrectionists um and um who are trying to like stage a white nationalist takeover this country like this is a time when we are at a, I think, a huge crossroads moment where those one of those visions is failing dramatically, publicly, horrifically, and we are seeing horrible things happen to Palestinians. Um, and like people are people are retreating into the idea, this idea of of military dominance still and militarism and isolation. Um, but like we are watching that vision fail. And like the task of our movements is to bring people to say like, we know you are watching this fail and you know why, like, like, and, and actually bring people into another way. Again, a strategy for liberation for Palestinians that's also about liberation for Jews and about survival for all of us. Yeah, thank you so much. I think that's a very beautiful place to end um, and a really beautiful vision for us to take with us. Um, I really appreciate you all being here for this. Uh, to the audience, really appreciate your time and thanks again with your patience and the technical difficulties. I think we ended up getting to have a great conversation uh, and really appreciate you sticking with us. If this is something you're interested in, you know, this is not the end. These actions are going to continue. These discussions are going to continue. Uh, you can plug in um, in many ways. You can follow uh, Jewish Voice for Peace and If Not Now on various social media uh, to see what they are up to. Um, to learn more about the history of some of this, you can check out Atalia's book, um, which is called Days of Awe, Reimagining Jewishness and Solidarity with Palestinians. Um, and of course, you can also uh, follow Jewish Currents and our coverage, um, you know, of the ongoing Israeli assault on Gaza and of American political dynamics and uh, Jewish left dynamics in response. Um, so we're at jewishcurrents.org. Um, and to subscribe, I think it's jewishcurrents.org slash subscribe, or, you know, you can just, you'll, you'll find the button on our website and, you know, we can get you the, the stuff and we're on all the social media as well. Um, and also I know Haymarket, you know, you can follow their channel um, to continue to um, see a lot of important events on this issue. So thank you all for your time. Uh, solidarity to everybody. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you next time. <laughs>